to sing, and we've come to study this Redeemer. And so this morning we return to our study of Micah. If you do not have a sermon outline, just lift your hand. Somehow you got past our guards standing at the doors this morning. And if you're at home, take out your notes. And again, uh, you can print those out from on being online. This morning we come to the Lord's great deliverer um, as seen in Micah chapter 5. Micah chapter 5. Let's review a little bit, especially for those who are new to us this morning. We want you to know where we've been and what we've been doing. We've been studying this book called The Prophecy of Micah. And this was written 700 years before our Lord Jesus Christ would come and live on the earth and give up his life for us. And we see that God is dealing with his people through this prophet Micah. Notice that there's three prophecy cycles, and by now you have to have this if you've been around here for a while. If you've, if you've been here for a little while, you have to have these two blanks, I hope. Fill them in on your outline if you've been here for a little bit. The pro- each prophecy cycle has two components. The first one starts with a what? A J. A J. Okay, yeah, it starts with a J. It, it's judgment, you're right. It's judgment. But there's a second one. And what is the second prophecy component? Mercy. Very good. This is important for us to understand. The Old Testament does present the justice of God and the judgment of God. But the Old Testament also is laden with God's mercy. It's a common misunderstanding that so often we have in our society today. Notice the next one that is here, the setting. And the setting is this, that the people of Israel are in rebellion against God. They have sinned against God. And so Micah's message is seeking to bring God's people back to himself and uh, cause them to see that he is a holy God and that the way that they are living is not honoring to him. And so he preaches God's judgment to him. Now, let me tell you that God's preaching of his judgment to us is an important thing. That as we study this, we learn more about who God is and the fact that there's things in our own lives that do not line up with his holiness. This is what his word is all about, that we may come to know who he is, that we have wronged him, and that he is a merciful God that will save us if we will come to him in faith. There's the first cycle that is here. We've already studied the first cycle. Notice there with me that there's destruction, but there's also a regathering. That's the mercy. And then the second cycle is the one that we're in right now. There is doom that is coming. We studied that a few weeks ago in chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. We read all about the evil leaders. We read all about the evil hearts of the people, that they had adopted the gods that were around them instead of the God of creation. And so there is a judgment coming upon them, but God promises also a deliverance. And it's a deliverance that is powerful and beautiful. And so the last couple of weeks, we've looked at the deliverance through the coming kingdom, and this morning we come to the deliverer. So this is the deliverer. Um, Who is the deliverer? That's what Micah is going to talk about. That's what part of what Micah is going to show us as we study. Notice that the judgment prophecies are intended to lead God's people to what? To repentance, to turn to him in goodness and in his grace. Now notice here in chapter 5, as we start this morning, chapter 5, we're going to be looking at God's deliverance, not just through his coming kingdom, but through the one who will bring that kingdom. And this is the deliverer. Now, if you can, just look right here at the end of my nose for a minute. In the last year, there have been people on two sides of the camp, not only in America, but around the world. You know, when I lived in France, my neighbor one time said to me, he said, you know, Andrew, it's very, very ridiculous that French people don't get a chance to vote in the American election. And I said, what? And he said, what you guys do over there affects my pay. It affects my job. You know, America is powerful, so the world is interested. And I'm not advocating that. I don't think that that's the way it ought to be. I'm not into a one-world government, by the way. Um, But I do recognize that people around the world have been looking at a guy named Joe Biden or a guy named Donald Trump as a deliverer. 
I mean, you would, you would ultimately think, by the way, people are so passionate about either one of these two people and so wound up about this that we must view these guys as a deliverer of one short sort or another. Well, this morning, as we come to Micah chapter 5, the Lord's grand plan and the Lord's grand deliverer, we need to recognize that this is far beyond any earthly man. This is far beyond any, any glorious individual. Instead, this goes to the glorious Savior. Remember with me that in Micah, yesterday, or last week, last week, we were looking at the Lord's grand plan. But now we see the Lord's grand deliverer. And as we come to this one, the Lord's grand deliverer, I want to help you a little bit. Remember last week at the bottom of the page, I went through a systematic theology, several statements about how is it that God saves us. Well, this morning I want to share with you a diagram. And the diagram kind of starts off, let's imagine that all the people of all of human history that have ever been on the world are represented here in this circle. And they're not only here, but I want us to also recognize that all of humanity is rebellious. And so this is all of rebellious humanity. Now, you may or may not be able to write on that ink. Sometimes it's hard to write on that. You have to warm up your pen or something, but you can perhaps write on that. But all of rebellious humanity. Remember with me the fall. And with the fall, all fall and fall short of the glory of God. But it's very interesting, and you notice there's a little tiny green square that is there. God has a people. God has a people, and these people are called the Hebrew people. He simply chose out of his sovereignty. Now, he could have chose to use the Aztecs. He could have chose to use um, the Chinese. He could have chose to use the Indian, the Pakistani. He could have chose to use the Persian, but, but he simply chose to use the Hebrew people. And he said, I will select one group of people for myself, and through this people that I will call my people, out of the sinfulness, I will bring my salvation. And so I want you to notice there that in that square, or there, there is a little line. And if you would, just kind of look at the image on the screen for a moment. There's this little red line that is there. Because not all of the Hebrew people were saved. Not all of the Hebrew people were truly God's people. Just by being in the nation didn't make you in the kingdom. But God had a plan, and he had a what we call a remnant. The Bible calls the remnant. These are the people who are God's. These are the people who have come to him in faith. And the remnant is looking forward to a coming Messiah. And so that's why there in the diagram there, you see we now, look at the screen, we now add the cross. So the people of the Old Testament are looking forward to the coming Messiah, and then we see Messiah comes, and it goes into the true people of God that are actually all around the world. So go to the next one there. Notice there. God's true people. So if you're, if you're wondering how God's salvation history works through, he chooses a nation out of the world. He blesses them with faith. They have a stream of faith, a stream pointing to the blood of the Messiah. And the Messiah comes and this is the great deliverer. So this, notice here with me on the outline as well, underneath where it says God's true children, you see this is Old Testament and New Testament. People say, oh yeah, I know that people in the New Testament are saved through Jesus Christ and his death on the cross, but what about the people in the Old Testament? Same thing. They were looking forward to the coming Messiah. We are looking back at the coming Messiah. The answer is the same. God, the Messiah in the flesh, is the one who saves us. He is the great deliverer. So perhaps this morning, somehow, some way, this helps you start to fit together your biblical theology. Now, like any illustration or any parable or whatever, this doesn't include every aspect of it. There's no way to really do that. 
Um, you know, with a parable, very often you, you just kind of go with the main point. You don't go with all of the ancillary ideas of the parable. You can go strange places if you do that. That's not the point of a parable. Well, with a diagram like this, I want to say to you that, that this is the, the big picture. This is the big idea. There's aspects of this that, that aren't fully adequate in explaining God's ultimate salvation, but I want you to start to see the, fo- the fact that God knows And God had a plan that he would bring salvation to the world, and he would bring salvation through his great deliverer, and that great deliverer would be himself. And this is why the second person of the Trinity comes and saves us by his grace. If you would, flip the sheet, and let's run to the passage, and let's see the passage as we continue on. Um, And I just want to remind you from last week, once again here, as we, as we look at this, that it was, it was the Lord's grand plan, and we saw at the end of the, the study last week that the nations don't know what's happening. They don't realize what is about to happen. That he is about, you remember the pictures of the oxen and the wheat, and the fact that the Lord is going to bring in all the sheaves, and then he is going to thresh the, the, the sheaves, and he is going to separate the true grains of wheat from all of the chaff, which the wind dro- drives away. And so they're, they're unaware of that, that the Lord has a grand plan to bring salvation to his people. Look at verse 1 and what it says, and we'll read the passage, and then we'll look at some key observations. Now muster your troops, O daughter of troops. Siege is laid against us. So the world is coming against God's people. Notice the word us. Circle the word us there. This is Micah and God's true people. So this is the true prophet of God with those who are faithful in the nation of Israel. So verse 1, now muster your troops, O daughter of troops. Siege is laid against us. With a rod, they strike the judge of Israel on the cheek. So they come up to God's people, and with a rod, insultingly smack the ruler of Israel. Insultingly smack the people of God. Look at verse 2. But you, O Bethlehem, Epaphra, who are too little be to be named, or too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel. Circle that, ruler in Israel. Notice about this ruler whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. So a ruler is coming. He's going to come through this town called Bethlehem, Epaphra. Look at verse 3. Therefore, he he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel, and he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall dwell secure for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth. So notice there the difference from verse 4 to verse 1. They come up and strike what seems to be a weak judge, a weak ruler. But God has a ruler that is going to be the one who rules and reigns over all things. And look at verse 5. It really goes with the thought of verse 4. And he shall be their peace. Verse 5 in the middle there, when the Assyrian comes into our land and treads in our places, then we will raise against him seven shepherds and eight princes of men. They shall shepherd the land of Syria with the sword. You don't usually shepherd with a sword, do you? And the land of Nimrod at its entrances, and he shall deliver us from the Assyrian when he comes into our land and treads within our border. Now, we're going to make sense of this. It's Hebrew poetry, so, and, and we, we, have to, we have to remember about Hebrew poetry, the, the intricacies of it, and there's not only Hebrew poetry, but there's Hebrew history. 
And there's God's salvation work. And in this, there's things looking back. There's things looking at the present when Micah wrote this. When the Assyrians are coming against them, God is using the Assyrians to show them that they're not God. God is humbling the nation because of their wickedness through a foreign power that's godless. And so there's, there's the moments of the day, but there's also in this text the moments of that which is going to come, that which is even eternally going to come. And so we see each one of these. Look at verse 1 with me, and let's look at a few of these. Number one, remember that the Lord has a grand plan. We studied that last week. And evil kings do not realize, they do not know what is coming. They don't realize it. They don't know what's about to come. And look there at verse 1. Look what it says. Now muster your troops, O daughter of of troops. Siege is laid upon us. Now, against us. This is the idea that the Assyrians come and trap Israel in Jerusalem. We know that that happened with Sennacherib. And that's part of the judgment that is there. And that God comes and he brings a deliverance in this. And part of that is, is what is woven into Micah, but it's also looking beyond their present day to our day. That's the interesting thing about so much in the, in the Old Testament that is a type of what is going to come to the future. It's a precursor. It's a foreshadowing of the deliverance that will come. Notice this. The wicked will attack the righteous. They strike the seemingly powerless king. They strike the seemingly powerless king. That's what they do. And then, notice here, they go from captivity to freedom and from defeat to victory. So the, they're going to attack the righteous. They're going to, the, the king that they attack seems not, I mean, is that not a picture of the Lord Jesus? When the Lord Jesus is there, I mean, we, we see the, the people around Jesus, some of them exalting him and recognize him as Messiah, and then others utterly rejecting him, even to the point of death. And so they, they think we've won. They think that they've rejected him. But notice this. He leads them through his suffering from captivity to freedom and from defeat into victory. That's part of what we see in Micah, this coming king. Look at verse 2 with me, and let's read verse 2. Look what it says. But you, O Bethlehem, Epaphra, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, for you, for from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose going, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. I want you to notice a couple of things from this passage. This is so glorious. The Lord promises the unlikely ruler. This ruler seems unlikely. You say, what do you mean so unlikely? Well, remember with me that Bethlehem is a tiny town, and the people who were from that town were from a very small clan. But yet that was a special group of people because that group of people were in the lineage, they were in the heritage through which the Messiah would be born. So it first started off with David, the the lineage of David. King David would become the king. Now, it's interesting, and I've I've included here um, the story of David being anointed king because it's very interesting, and it shows us some very interesting things from verse 2. This is part of the way God works, and I want you to see this. Look at what it says there, like King David. Um, King David was an unlikely ruler. Really? Yeah, he was. I want you to take your page and look at 1 Samuel Samuel chapter 16. We want to see the first main section that we want to see here, and we're going to move very fast, so try to keep up. Um, This is David being anointed king. Remember with me that Saul just absolutely flames out as a wicked king of Israel, and God says, I have a different king for you. And so he raises up Samuel the prophet, and he calls Samuel to go and anoint a new king while Saul is still reigning as king. But God has a different king. So look with me in verse 1. The Lord said to Samuel, 
How long will you grieve over Saul since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. So he had a, a flask, like a horn from a ram. He says, fill it with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse, to Jesse, the, what is he called? A what? A Bethlehemite. What does that mean? Somebody from Bethlehem, right? I will send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite. For I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Now, just so you note, for I have provided myself a king. That's the same language that we see in Micah chapter 2, that I will provide for myself a ruler, a deliverer. Look at verse 4. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, do you come peaceably? Because you see there, a righteous prophet of God like Samuel, when you're, a wicked, when you're a wicked nation and the prophet shows up, suddenly you're very nervous. You know, pastors sometimes experience this. Occasionally, you know, something happens where we'll go, and, and sometimes it's because somebody is really running in sin and running in, in ways that are contrary to God. And um, we show up to try to help and try to guide them back. And sometimes there's a great deal of fear. Now, some of you all haven't done anything wrong, and we show up at the door, and you're trembling. I don't understand that. You don't need to do that. But here we see that Samuel shows up, shows up at Bethlehem, and look at that. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling. Do you come peaceably? And he said, peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse, and notice this, his, and his sons, and invited them to the sacrifice. Now here's where we see God's work. When they came, he looked at Eliab. So that's the first son. They come. When they came, he looked at Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, his natural power. That's the idea of about Eliab. He was a powerful, perhaps tall and, and strong. Because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Verse 8, then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel and said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then verse 9, Then Jesse made Shammah pass by. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Verse 10, Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And notice this, seven of his sons pass before him, and the Lord has not chosen these. And he said, there remain, Is there any more sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest. But behold, he's keeping the sheep. So he's so young, he's out keeping the sheep while everybody else is gathered with the big prophet that's visiting from out of town. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and get him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. Verse 12, and he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and, his be and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Now what is so interesting about this is that Samuel keeps thinking, well, certainly it's this big guy, or certainly it's this strong guy, or certainly it's this older guy, and, and they run out of sons. This is unlikely. Well, so who is going to, oh, well, we have a young boy that's out attending the flock. You see, this was unlikely that David would be the king. And that is the same picture that we see that God is showing us my ways are not your ways and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts, declares the Lord. Very often, God is working things out in order to show his power, not your power, not our power. God is saying, I want you to learn to trust in my word, in my plan, in my ways. 
And that's what we see not only with Samuel, but that's also what we see when the coming of our Lord Jesus. He comes in the form of a baby. Nobody expected Messiah to come in the form of a baby. Most would, would have believed that he would come riding down from heaven on a great chariot. Most would believe he would, become, he would come as a powerful ruler. The Jews were looking for a powerful ruler to throw off these harassing Romans. And so what we begin to see in the book of Micah is that, is that the prophecy of this coming Messiah, along with other prophecies, Isaiah and Daniel and other prophecies, are showing that a king is going to come, but they didn't know exactly what it would be like. But Micah gives the hint he's going to come through Bethlehem. Now, you say... In verse 12, he sent and brought him. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and handsome. The word ruddy, we don't use that word very often. Do you know what the word ruddy means? It kind of means of red complexion. And the idea of red complexion <laughs> is, is this virulent, strong, healthy, red-faced, active person. And I, I guess a young Harry is to some degree a picture of that. So that, that's, that's a bit like what is pictured here in this text, is that he's just a boy, but he has, that God has a plan to work through him. So the first thing I want you to see there is that this ruler is unlikely. The second thing I want you to see here is, is that the Jews expected Messiah from Bethlehem, from here. They expected Messiah from Bethlehem. So you can fill that in. He, the Jews expected the Messiah to come through here. And I want you to see this in, in Matthew chapter 2. So go back to that text on the other page, page 3. You see, when the wise men came looking for the newborn king, we see how much they, the Jews were expecting the newborn king to come through Bethlehem. Look at verse 1. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. So this is all in Matthew chapter 2. Look at verse 2. Saying, where is he who was born king of the Jews? Now, who are they asking this of? The king of the Jews. Herod, the wicked king. For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Verse 3. When Herod heard, when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled in all of Jerusalem with him. So when the, it's kind of like when mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. Well, when Herod ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. Look at verse 4. And assembling all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ, the Messiah, was to be born. And they told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, put out there to the side, which prophet? The prophet Micah, and here it is. The text that we're studying from Micah shows up in the New Testament, and here it is. In Matthew chapter 2, and you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Look at verse 7. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared to them. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring, him, bring me word that I may come and what? Worship him. Is that what Herod's intent was? No. And Herod was the Jewish king. Do you start to see here that just because you're in the nation of Israel doesn't mean that you're one of God's people? Here, here Herod is their king. And he wants to kill the Messiah. We can start to see God's big picture of how he's bringing about his salvation through the Old Testament to us. We can, we, maybe for some of you, you're new to studying the Bible. I hope this is very helpful to you to start to see that this is what the chosen people are about. God is going to bring his Messiah. But even them, with all of the blessings that God gave upon, him, upon them, they still would reject him. This is showing us the great grace of God that he continues with us. Look down in John chapter 7, fast forward 30 years. Jesus has been preaching and teaching. Jesus has grown up. He's about to go to the cross. But the people are debating, who is Jesus? Over and over again, we see them saying, 
who is this guy? I mean, he, seemed, he does these miracles. He teaches these, these beautiful truths. He is not merely one of us. Look at verse 40. It says, when they heard these ways, some of the people said, this really is the prophet. Speaking of the prophet that's coming to, going to come, the Messiah. Verse 41, others said, this is the Christ. But some said, is the Christ to come from Galilee? Galilee's in the north, not down at Bethlehem. Verse 42, has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from where? Bethlehem, the village where David was. So there was division among the people over him. So they're looking at Jesus. It appears to be from, from Galilee. How could he be the Messiah? God has a grand plan. He's revealing his grand plan in all of this. So I just want you to notice here that this is an unlikely ruler. But it's not only an unlikely ruler that's coming, that this is also the Lord promises the eternal ruler. And this is very important. If you're seeking to understand who Jesus is, you need to understand that he was the one that we would mistake he is the one that we would reject. He is the one that we would not see who he really was because he comes in humility. He's the unlikely ruler. It's kind of like when Goliath, you know, David is anointed, and then here comes David before Goliath, and Goliath just laughs and says, you send me a boy? You've got to be kidding me. You see, God's ways are not our ways. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. He always has a grander plan, and he's showing it is he who is working, and he is the hero, not David. Notice here with me that this ruler is eternal. Look over there in verse 2, and notice what it says. For from you shall come for me, for from you shall come for me, one who is, is to be ruler in Israel. And then notice these last two lines here of the poetry whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Now, we're going to see just how ancient days when we see this. I want you to notice these passages of Scripture. So go with me over there to page 4. I want you to notice that this is talking about where Jesus comes from. In the beginning was what? The Word right above the word Jesus. This is talking about Jesus. And John's gospel begins, and it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Verse two, he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. Underline that, all things were made. So this is creator God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Verse 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. And so first we see in the picture, John begins his whole gospel talking about who Jesus is by saying he is the preexistent God before all things were ever created. Look at verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Look at John 8, 48. So we fast forward into Jesus' ministry, and again, the debate, as we were just talking about, rages over who Jesus is. And there's, this is a great passage for you to read later today, but I just want you to see in verse 58, Jesus finally answers them, and look what he says, and he says to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they came along and they said, what? You claim to be older than Abraham? And Abraham's dead. And if Abraham died, who are you supposed to be? And he says, before Abraham ever was, I am. So here Jesus is revealing who he is. Jesus is just saying to them, I am God. This Messiah is God in the flesh. Look at John 17 and verse 5. Jesus prays for the church in this, in this passage, and notice what he says. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory, look what it says, read it out loud together with me, with the glory that 
I had with you before the world existed. So here we see the second person of the Trinity praying to the first person of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit together, and the Son is saying to the Father, and now let your plan come to fruition. This is just before he goes to the cross, and the picture is is that restore the glory that I had with you before I came. There's other passages here, Second Philippians chapter 2, um, though he existed in the form of God, did not acquire count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, becoming in the, in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself to becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. This is the ruling king, and then God raises him up so that he is the Lord to the glory of the Father. Look at Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3 at the very end. Very important passage, and this will be the, the last major passage that we look at. Look at first Hebrews 1, verses 1 through 3. Look what it says. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Jesus showed up in his teaching, living his life whom he anointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. Read it out loud. After making purifications for sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Let's go back to our outline and let's look and see. Here's the picture. He's the unlikely ruler and he is the eternal ruler. What I want you to see from these passages is is that this leader, this ruler, this deliverer that is coming is the deliverer who is eternal. Eternity past and eternity future. This is God himself. Look at verse 3 with me and notice what it says in verse 3 in the box on the page. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of the brothers shall return to the people of Israel. Now what is this speaking of? You see, Israel had to wait for the Messiah King. And in fact, not only did they have to wait, but they had to wait 700 years. They had to wait in faith. And that remnant who was faithful to the Word of God was listening and waiting. And you know what? That remnant, even even others had read the prophecies and the truth. God had a salvation that was outside that nation of Israel. That some had heard the truth. These kings from the east, they had heard that a great king was being born. And by faith, those kings from the east come looking for him. So they had been reading the Old Testament scriptures of Micah, and they came looking for that. You see, God always is moving people. He always has his own. He has his ways of bringing people to himself. So not only did they have to wait 700 years, but then God gathers them together. Notice that. Then the rest of his brothers, in verse 3, then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. God is gathering together his people. Look at verse 4. And he shall stand and shepherd his flock. So this is speaking of the deliverer. He shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. I want you to notice this in verse 4, that the great and good shepherd will rule over all of the earth. And not only will he rule over all the earth, but he will rule over all of the earth by God's power. Do you see that in verse 4? Look what it says in verse 4. And he shall stand and shepherd his flock. And what does it say there in the next line? In the what? In the strength of the Lord. You see, this is God's power. This is how we know that this is the power of God upon the deliverer. And what we come to find, what we come to see as we go forward 700 years, this is Jesus of Nazareth. This is Jesus who comes and lays down his life. And he is the good shepherd, the most unlikely ruler. 
but yet the eternal ruler. Not only do we see that, but he brings security to his own. Do you see that there in the end of verse 4? And they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth. And then look at verse 5, beginning of verse 5, and it says, and he shall be their peace. That really goes with verse 4. And notice here with me, not only does he bring security to his own, but he brings peace to his own. That's what God does through this coming deliverer. You know, I, as I look at these passages and I think about this, here we are in mid-November, we're about to come into Christmas season, and so often the only time the church ever hears from the book of Micah is, is basically from this passage right here. It's verse 2. And very often we, we don't really look deeply at the whole prophecy. We don't often look deeply even at this this, we just say, oh, he's going to be born in Bethlehem. But no one's ever explained to us that, man, the Jews were expecting it. Look at them. They were, saying, they were debating whether Jesus was the Messiah because they were saying, man, he's from Nazareth. And they didn't realize, oh, no, he actually was born in Bethlehem. We, we don't realize very often that as the wise men come, that the Jews, they knew where to look for the coming king, but yet they weren't looking. And even when some came announcing, they were not open to listening. You see, there's a lot here for us to see. And as we go into Christmas time, we can begin to just really appreciate, listen, we can really appreciate the tremendous incarnation of God. That means the coming into the flesh of God. Brothers and sisters, listen. If we've ever needed to truly know the deliverer, it's now. I mean, the world is messed up. Our hearts are messed up. Our government is messed up. All of the technology that we think is so great is creating great ungodliness. It is creating great selfishness, narcissism. All of the entertainment, all the shows after shows after shows after shows, mainlining Satan's thoughts into our minds and our hearts when we emotionally get involved and in, in follow storylines that are not of God over and over and over again. And we maybe even as Christians wonder sometimes why we're so miserable. And it's because our eyes are are very often fixed on the world instead of being fixed upon Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Friends, we need to remember who the great deliverer is. We need to understand it's not Donald Trump, never has been, never will be. It's not Joe Biden. And it's not any leader that this world has to offer. The kingdom that we serve is not of this world. We are sojourners. We are foreigners passing through this world. And those who are in Christ, our eyes are on the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And so when we come into this December, may we pay attention to the biblical message that God promised a king. And may we not be like either the Jews of the first century 2,000 years ago that didn't see it and that rejected him. May we not be like the people today that have no room for the great deliverer. May we pay attention to the prophecies that are given. May we know what God has said and promised because that is where we find peace. You see, it says that he shall be their peace. This is a peace that no one and nothing in this world can offer. And it comes from fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Brothers and sisters, let's let's don't let Christmas go the way of the rest of the things of 2020. We ought to celebrate thanksgiving with joy. We ought to remember that we praise God and thank God in the good times and in the bad, and we do that by faith. And that's glorifying to God. 
And when we come to celebrating the remembrance of the incarnation of Christ, the birth of Christ, we ought to do so and say, this was the king. This was the coming king who would show us what humility looks like, would show us what wisdom looks like, would show us what patience looks like, would show us what grace looks like, and would show us what power looks like when he rises from the dead. And so we say the deliverer of Micah is the deliverer that we need. Oh, church family, may we dwell in security of our great deliverer. May we dwell in the peace of our great deliverer. Now look at the end of verse 5 and 6, and we'll be done here. Look at verse 5. It says, when the Assyrian comes, Assyrian comes into our land and treads in our palaces, then we will rise against him seven shepherds and eight princes of men. We're going to say, see what that means. Look at verse 6. And they shall shepherd the land of Assyria with the sword and the land of Nimrod as its entrances. And he shall deliver us from the Assyrian when he comes into our land and treads within our border. Verse 5, the the observation I want you to see. The wicked of every age will attack God's people, the church. The wicked of every age will attack God's people, the church. That's what we see here. But God has the full number of his shepherds to care for his people. First of all, there is the great shepherd that we've just been studying about. But here we see that God is going to raise up shepherds to help care for his people. Now, this is the beautiful picture of the way God causes us to dwell secure and to have his peace. This morning, the place where you can find security and peace that this world cannot offer is in the truth of God. And so you've come into the body of Christ to hear the truth proclaimed. And let me just say to you, this is it. You found the right thing. And if you've never received him, we would call you to receive him, to receive the gospel that we are preaching, the good news of God that he will forgive you of your sins and he will give you the grace and the faith and the repentance that you need to follow him. Just come to him and believe. Notice this. The wicked of every age will attack God's people. That's what we see. The Assyrian comes into the land, into the palaces. He comes, they attack the church, but God has a plan. He's going to raise up. Now that that idea, uh, look what it says there in the middle of verse 5. Then he will raise against him seven shepherds and eight princes of men. This is a Hebrew device. And it, it's, we see it numerous places in Hebrew poetry where it says, it's, similarly in Proverbs, it says, six things the Lord hates, yea, seven. So it's a statement of saying, this is the full measure, this is the, the full amount. That, that's part of what here. Seven kind of is seen as the perfect number in the Bible, and this is saying that there's seven um, shepherds that are going to be there, yay, eight. What does that mean? That means you're going to have all you need. God is going to supply all the ones you need. You never need to wonder if God is going to supply the right number of shepherds. God is going to supply the pastors that are needed to help care for his people. Now, I want to remind you, pastors are not the Savior. Pastors only point to the Savior. The shepherd, the great shepherd, the good shepherd is Jesus. The chief shepherd that we serve is Jesus. But God in his wisdom raises up other what we call under-shepherds or pastors and puts them in charge over his flock so that they may hear the gospel, so that they may hear the truths of God and come to believe and to know and be built up in the truth, and so that they may be protected. Sometimes a a pastor's job is to protect the flock. Very often, Satan sends wolves. Satan sends those who are wrong in doctrine or wrong in morality or wrong in spirit, wrong in motive. And sometimes, God, that's part of the role of a pastor, is to go and to defend the flock from the attacks that are evil. And we see this, that God's plan is not only to send the great deliverer, but he's going to send those who work with the great deliverer through the 2,000 years that we're at so far in order to safely see God's people be where they need to be. Look at Acts 20, verse 28. This is right there underneath the note of number five. Um, 
And we see that this command is being given to a group of pastors. It says, keep watch over yourselves and the entire flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. You see, the Holy Spirit, these are, these are God's shepherds. People don't make a pastor their pastor. Ultimately, God does that. Some of you know the story of Marcy and I coming here. I, I'm just saying, well, I, I, I didn't have anything to do with it. Never dreamed of being the pastor of my home church. Never crossed my mind. And I know it didn't cross a bunch of y'all's minds either. <laughs> you know, God, God raises up his laborers. Look what it says there. The entire flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. You see, the church doesn't belong to the pastor. The church belongs to Jesus. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. So there's going to become over and over and over again attacks on the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we see all of this right here in Micah's little prophecy. Notice here in verse 6. Let's read verse 6 again. They shall shepherd the land of Assyria with the sword and the land of Nimrod at its entrances. So Assyria and Nimrod, put it right above the word Nimrod, Babylon. So these are the two enemies that are coming against God's people, Assyria and Babylon. Actually, Babylon is now under Assyria. It says, and also Babylon. And so here we see this. But look what God is going to do. Both of these enemies triangulate on God's people. And yet, look at verse 6, and he shall deliver us from the Assyrian when he comes into our land and treads within our border. I want you to see this in verse 6. God uses his shepherds to rule his people by his word. God uses his shepherds to rule his people by his word. And what is the word? It's the sword. That's where we see this, with the sword. When we look at the sword, look at Ephesians chapter 6, verses seven, 6 through 17. Here's the great weapon that we have. And take the helmet of salvation, and look what it says, and the sword of the Spirit, circle it, which is the word of God. So the sword of God's Spirit, the great weapon that we have against all of Satan's ungodliness and against all of his attacks is the word that is sitting in your lap. This is the truth that protects us from hell. This is the truth that protects us from certain destruction, from self-destruction. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached. You see all of this from Micah, or not from it, but it's referenced in Micah. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead. Notice this, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal. But the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. You see, the great deliverer delivers us through the Word of God. We hear of a gospel who died, of a Savior who died, who would rise again, who would come and deliver us, and this is the gospel that we preach. And then look as we close, Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18. Jesus affirms Peter's confession that he is the Christ. And I want you to see this. And look what Jesus says. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church. Underline it. I will build my church. I've underlined the rest. Let's read it out loud together. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. My friends, God rules and reigns and delivers us from the attacks of Satan and his minions and all of ungodliness. And he does it through the glorious word of God, the word of our deliverer. Amen? Amen. Let's stand together as we pray.
Holy Father, you have sent your deliverer, and we have believed. Lord, we look to the Lord Jesus as our hope. Lord, we proclaim that he is the Messiah. Jesus of Nazareth, born in Bethlehem, raised by Joseph and Mary, ridiculed from his first day of preaching. And yet, Lord, you stayed, and you were patient. Month after month, year after year, you endured our insults and our rejection. Lord, we mocked you. We rejected you. You came to your own, and they did not receive you. And yet you stayed. And you went all the way to the cross to deliver us from our sins. How great a deliverer you are, Lord. May we look to you in faith and obedience. May we choose your way instead of this world's way. May we, Father, embrace the holiness of God instead of the wickedness of the world. May we see that you have us on a path to a far greater land, a land where there's no more sin, there's no more wickedness, there's no more deception, There's no more brokenness, Lord, that there's no more sickness and there's no more death. Why would we choose the things of this world? Lord, do a work in us. Help us to be the bride that you've called us to be. Lord, increase our path of sanctification. May it change the way we talk. May it change our vocabulary. May it change our entertainment, may it change our values, and Lord, our passions, the things that we go for. Oh Lord, may we worship you with the way we live our lives because you are worthy. Thank you, Lord, for a man named Micah, a man that you rose up to preach the gospel, a man that would tell 700 years before Messiah would come where he would be born and what he would do. May we believe that message and live by it. In the strong name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Would you sing together?